Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Strategy Game Podcast. I am so excited and honored to have leadership guru Katie Cole with me. Katie, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Lauren. It's really an honor to be with you today. And I'm so excited to just share all of the wisdom that you have because you have um, written um, a book, you've uh, consulted with many, many leaders and entrepreneurs over the years, um, many organizations. And so I just love to hear a little bit about your journey and the story that has gotten you to where you are today, because I always you know, talk about how entrepreneurship is such a winding road and there are so many different paths and threads that lead us to where we get to. And a lot of times those things earlier in life, earlier in our childhood, we can look back and say, hey, I can see that thread and I can see how it has weaved its way throughout my life into where I am today. So I would just love to hear anything that comes to mind that you'd like to share with us about your journey thus far. Sure. Thank you. Well, I got very entrepreneur and never really imagined myself owning my own company or doing a lot of consulting or coaching. Uh, I've really always just had a heart to serve people. I grew up in a really strong faith family. Um, I felt like my gifts were really oriented towards serving people. So I actually got my bachelor's degree in nursing uh, for that purpose to help people. I uh, moved from the Northwest to South Florida for a job, eventually started working at a university here in town, um, overseeing their health and counseling center, uh, got promoted to be Dean of Students. While I was there, I picked up a master's degree in human resource development, again, because it was all about training people to be great employees, training people to be great leaders, helping organizations move their goals forward through their people. And so a, a lot of times I think it's easy in business to just think in business terms, but really everything that we do in business has a person attached to it somewhere. And so if we don't know how to train and lead people, we really can't move our business where it needs to go. Um, and then after a few years of doing that, I got recruited to be a part of my very large, fast growing church here in South Florida. Um, and so I worked there for 16 years full time and kind of grew up with the church. We, when I came, we had about 3000 people. When we, when I left, I was executive director over all the campuses. We had, uh, seven campuses at the time about, um, 50,000 plus people. So it was a large organization. It was a big budget. I managed a lot of people. And uh, from there, I started getting, because it was a well-known church, I started getting a lot of uh, invitations from other networks, other churches, a lot of business leaders from uh, my church who wanted me to come in and teach leadership or coach them and how to scale their business. And so uh, pretty soon that, that demand got a little bigger than my job. And I was a bit ready for a change too, um, and ready, I think, to kind of do my own thing. And so that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing now. Even the books that I've written uh, have really come out of the needs I'm seeing with my clients. And I start having the same conversation over and over again, or drawing the same picture on the whiteboard. And I start to go, oh, this is actually really helpful everywhere I go. I should probably put this in a format that someone can buy and just read. I don't have to show up in person to teach it to you. So uh, that's really where I'm at now. Um, I do a lot of coaching. I do a lot of what we call life plans, which is sort of like a intense personal retreat that um, create sort of a strategy for your own life and how your business and vocation flow out of that. Uh, and then I continue to speak and work with a lot of organizations on how to grow them forward, how to help their people become everything they're meant to be. That is awesome. Thank you, Katie. I love that journey. I also love that you didn't start out necessarily thinking I'm going to be an entrepreneur and have my own company. It came from a heart of serving. And I think a lot of founders can relate to that. I know that for me, I love entrepreneurship and business, but really at, at the heart of story work and what I do, I'm really passionate about helping people see the people that they serve and how that they can communicate with them in a way that they feel seen, known, and heard, right? So like there's always this underlying passion, hopefully to serve, right? The people um, that you want to impact and influence, right? For, for good. So that's really awesome. So thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Tell me about the books that you've written, because I think, you know, as you were talking about the themes that you're seeing, right? You pull out themes and then from there that usually turns into a book. Can you tell me what themes you've seen over the years and then how those have turned into what you've written about? 
Sure. Well, my first book, uh, which really, if anyone buys this, my apologies, you know, your first attempt at something is never very impressive, but I will say the first attempt led to the other ones. So my first book is called Sticky Note Leadership. And really it's about helping le uh, leaders who are probably new to leadership. It's not really like you're a young leader, like you're 20, but you might be newer to leadership or maybe newer to higher levels of delegation or new newer to managing people over a long period of time. And most of us as leaders, we sort of fall into this trap of uh, keeping some things to ourselves that we don't want to give up, delegating maybe the wrong things, not knowing how to equip people. And most young leaders, young, again, young in leadership, uh, we tend to have people who are working for us that we thought would make our life and job easier, and it ends up being harder. Um, and so if you find yourself in that place where you're like, it's just easier to do it myself. I'll just, it'll be faster. It'll be better. It'll be all that. This is really a book on de delegation, how to think about your people differently and how to delegate in a way that is serving and equipping them, not delegating in a way that's dumping or micromanaging them. Uh, the second book is called Developing Female Leaders. And this came out of working with a series of uh, big organizations and a lot of faith-based organizations, or I worked a lot in the tech industry, which is very male populated also. So organizations that had kind of a culture of more men than women in leadership roles. Um, and because I'm from a faith background and I was working with a lot of churches, it has a lot of faith perspective, but most of us in America, because uh, religion has been a big part of our culture, especially if you're from the South or grew up with any sort of faith connection, church or a Christian school, or even just in a culture that really valued those things. A lot of times uh, women have grown up with sort of some mindsets and some conditioning that we aren't aware of that's holding us back. And my uh, goal with this book was to actually work with the leaders of organizations who are coming to me and saying, Katie, we have these women on our team, or I keep trying to give this gal a promotion, but she doesn't want it. Or um, we see all this talent, but we can't seem to do a good job of developing them or really releasing them into leadership. And so, you know, when most of these guy leaders would talk to me, uh, they were really well-intentioned and had good hearts. The things they were doing were not always the best thing for the women on their team, even though they meant well. And so I was a little perclumped, to be really honest with you, about how exactly to help them realize that, you know, this sharp young leader who's a woman, the best move for her is not to become your admin assistant. That's, that's not helping her lead and flourish as someone gifted in leadership. But it was really hard for them to understand. And it was hard for me to articulate, to be really honest, because it seemed so obvious. And because they were trying so hard, I didn't want to make them feel bad. I wanted them to be encouraged and equipped to do a job that would be more effective. So this book is about, uh, it's a huge research project that I did. Uh, and, and, Ended up um, coming up with eight best practices that leaders, men, women, business, church can do to do a better job developing female leadership talent uh, in their organization. The big surprise to me is how many women have loved reading it and sort of found these aha moments about their own leadership experience. And so I encourage it for anyone who's kind of going like, I want to grow as a leader. I probably come from some places where it's caused me to question myself or I wonder if I'm doing too much or not enough or all that kind of thing. It's really a great book. And it also is a book about inclusion and diversity. And so if you're wanting, sorry, that's my dog letting himself into my office. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, work from home life. Yeah, um, that's right. <laughs> uh, anyway, or if you're leading an organization that wants to do a good job in making sure you have equity and diversity at your leadership table and some of the blind spots, all of us have leaders as leaders have, particularly when you're growing a new business, uh, yeah. I would really encourage you to take a look at developing female leaders. Uh, and then as I toured with that book the last couple of years, it ended up becoming a bestseller in its category. I've spoken to uh, thousands and thousands of people about it, big conferences, worked with a lot of organizations around it. As I was doing that, I had a lot of women come to me and want individual coaching or have questions about, I've been given this leadership role, but I hate it, or yeah. um, I, I, I'm so stressed out, or I'm very overwhelmed, or I can't figure out how to balance my home commitments and my work commitments. And so, and the biggest thing to be honest is how many women were taking demotions or stepping out. Mm -hmm. They had worked really hard to get, get into these roles, but it was the role itself was causing them to violate some of their values or other priorities in their life. And they couldn't navigate putting all of those together and integrating their life. 
And so those women are really who I wrote the next book for, which is called Find Your Leadership Voice in 90 Days. And it's really about reframing our mindsets as female leaders. I will say a ton of guys have read this book and really loved it because it's really just great leadership principles. But I do try to address it as someone who's been in leadership for 30 years and uh, has had a family and stayed working full time most of that time. Um, what are some of the lessons I've learned? How do I think about some of these situations? I'm in a lot of rooms where I am the only or, or perhaps maybe the first female to ever step foot in a room of high level, very powerful men. What do I say to myself to go into there? How do I debrief myself afterwards? How do I make sure I'm taking advantage of opportunities, but not overstretching? How do I prioritize taking care of myself? So it's kind of a lot of wisdom and insights that uh, from my personal life, from other leaders I know in a small daily read to try and help us really reformat our thinking. Um, most of the time we have more capacity than we realize. It's that inner voice, that sticky floor that really gets us into trouble and holds us back from being everything we're designed to be. That's amazing. I love how you call it the sticky floor. So those are the voices. Would those also be similar to lies we may believe about our identity that hold us back that come from maybe woundedness or past hurts? And is this part of something that you work through with uh, women that go through the life plan process? So now what I'm hearing is I love this because it's all weaving together. So what you're noticing, the themes that you're noticing, you're then writing about them and you're creating offerings around them, which from a business perspective is great. And I think key for our listeners to take away from this, right? So it's not only the writing component, but it's all these things that go together thinking about, well, how can I now scale this offering, right? So I can write a book and I can get this out to many people but what about those that may want to do a deeper dive that may want some one-on-one -on -one feedback with me? And is that really why you created the life plan? Well, yes, I think all of that. Um, so uh, I think the for me, because I really desire to help people answer the call that's on their life, uh, it is trying to take some of these concepts. And for me, you're exactly right. When there is a theme, when I find a lot of people asking the same question in different parts of the country, or a lot of women, um, when I coach them, they're uh, kind of getting stuck on the same topic applied in, you know, six different industries and in they're, you know, different decades, you know, in fact, sometimes decades apart in their age. Um, then I'm starting to realize, gosh, this is sort of a systemic thing that we're dealing with. And the sticky floor is a great word. It comes from the research around female leadership. So most of us are probably familiar with the glass ceiling, which is those sort of invisible barriers that we as women sometimes bump up against that prevent us from getting a business loan or prevent us from being able to be a part of a certain network or prevent us from getting a promotion. But the sticky floor is sort of the opposite of that. It's those things in our mind, those conversations and dialogues, old tapes, lies, all those things in our own mind that keep our feet stuck to the floor. And it's those pieces that oftentimes uh, women are challenged on that the guys we work with or for oftentimes have no understanding of what those actually are because they've grown up very differently. When, when I was growing up, uh, you know, there were a lot of guys around me who were given opportunities to speak or to lead or to organize. They imagined themselves in business. Um, I would say I didn't even think of myself as having a lifelong career. I kind of thought I would work till I got married and had a baby. And then I would do that. And then I'd like volunteer somewhere in my later years. Those, those were the female examples I had of really great women that I respected and admired. And it seemed like an amazing life. Like there was no reason to not want that. Uh, but most guys grow up, you know, from the age of five or six, knowing they're going to be a leader, knowing that they're going to have a job their whole life. And they're imagining themselves with a 40 year career. I never did that. And so that was one of my sticky floor issues, especially when uh, one of the reasons I went back to work full time after I had my son, because again, I kind of had this mentality of the life that was the best life for me inscribed on me. My husband had a very serious accident. He wasn't able to work and I had to go back to work full time. And it was such one of the hardest parts is it was such a paradigm shift for me to go, um, oh gosh, Lord, you actually are going to have me work for a long time. <laughs> like I kind of just wanted to be the, you know, third grade mom in the school. Like I didn't, I never imagined this for myself. And that idea that everything we accomplish has to start somewhere. And it almost always starts in our mind. You know, Lauren, you imagined yourself being an entrepreneur. You imagined yourself helping people. You imagined yourself being well-known and making a statement in an entire region of the country. Like these are things you had to imagine 
to begin doing the work that you're doing now. And most of us, because of the sticky floor, our imagination gets locked down into what we have already thought of, what we have already seen, what we were told we could do, um, what we saw as examples in front of us. And so a lot of times, which is mostly what I do through coaching and life planning is we start to crack open that limited thinking. Not that you can go be a millionaire if you, you know, not everyone gets to have these big grandiose dreams, but if that's actually something you want to do, anyone can actually do that. You just have to be willing to pay the price. So what is it that we need to unlock? What's holding you back so that your imagination can run free and you can dream a little so that you know the action steps to actually make those dreams come together. Oh, that's so good. So much wisdom there for our listeners. What's your sticky floor, right? Everyone listening, (laughs) think about that. That's so challenging. And it's true. You know, do you know the book, um, Harold and the purple crayon? It's a kid's book. I don't know. I don't. It it. sounds wonderful though. (laughs) It's a classic. It's an old one. I may have mentioned this on a podcast before, but that's how I envision myself. And listen, I have I have plenty of sticky floor things, but as I'm dreaming up new offerings and new places to go, um, I envision myself literally drawing. It's like Harold in the purple crayon. He has a magic crayon and he draws his own city and he draws his own path and his own road and his own boat. And, you know, whatever he creates comes to life, right? So that's really who we get to be as entrepreneurs, right? When our when we're unlocked, when we can be emotionally, spiritually, physically, all the things healthy, right? And that's why it's so important to remove any of those roadblocks. And I love that what you're doing through the coaching and the life planning is healthy helping people get unstuck. Um, Is there anything that comes to mind, any themes across the life plans, the sticky floors that you see that are recurring that you feel like might be important just to talk about? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, one of the biggest sticky floors, um, particularly for leaders and especially for female leaders is perfectionism, where we hold ourselves to these standards that I need to be really amazing from the very first time I try this, or it's going to be a disappointment to me. I'm going to disappoint the people around me. Um, It's going to be a failure, sort of this extreme thinking of it's either perfect or it's a failure. And that is a very limited thinking because if you uh, give it some thought, you realize, gosh, the, anytime you try something new, you can, you cannot be perfect at it, especially at, you know, if you're old enough to be listening to this podcast, you're old enough to be doing complicated things, but even a little baby who learns to roll over or to crawl or to walk, you have to try a bunch of different things. You actually have to grow muscles in the trying to be able to perform the task. And somewhere along the line, we tend to stop giving ourselves permission to learn. Um, Now I see some leaders, again, particularly female leaders, we tend to do this in extreme. We overcompensate for that um, fear of failure by going deep dive into studying. So I'm a learner. I want to be coachable. I want to do it. And so we study, we take classes, we get certified, we study, study, study. Then we study some more. Then we study some more. Then we shadow someone. Then we be mentored by someone. And we get stuck in this cycle, which really actually isn't learning. It's really just cycling in perfectionism through action. So you can either be stalled by perfectionism by doing nothing, or you can be stalled in perfectionism by doing something that doesn't actually move you forward. So take one class, make one phone call, uh, do one Google search, and then act on what you learned. And then once you've acted, go back and get another mentor, do another Google search, right? read one more book. Please don't read 11 books before you take one step. Um, I, I'm a researcher, so I fall into this. I, so that's the first one, perfectionism and making sure you're actually moving forward. Even if it's a baby step, the goal is to move forward. Don't allow yourself, as you said, to get stuck. That is I think um, one of the second ones is uh, caring too much about what other people's judgment of you are. Um, and so this, you know, on one extreme, there's sort of like people pleasing where we can easily want to be making sure everyone's pleased with us, um, kind of image management where I want to look this way to a certain person, look that way. It's a lot of time and energy, making sure that you are quote, pleasing everybody. And I would say sometimes leaders don't fall into typical codependency language around this, where we're like getting someone something to eat, even though they're 500 pounds, or we're, you know, sending our kid money, even though he's an addict, like that tends to be the extreme, but I would say leaders tend to want to have a good image and not ruffle any feathers anywhere they go. And so that kind of people pleasing, um, really gets you into trouble because 
leadership by definition means you have to lead. You have to do things people haven't done before. And that will always ruffle feathers because everyone wants the status quo or they want to be in charge of deciding what gets changed. When you start changing things, even if it's only things in your own life, it changes things for other people that they are not in control of. No one likes that. So you can't lead and please everyone at the same time. It's actually impossible to do. So that's on one the side of the extreme is this sort of people pleasing everywhere. The other side of the extreme is that I don't care what anyone thinks or I'm only out to please myself. And we can't lead. Again, leadership comes to people. So you have to have relationships and connections to move forward. You can't be so independent. And so somewhere in the middle is that healthy um, interdependent. So I'm not dependent on other people. I'm not independent and avoid of relationships, but I'm interdependent. I show up as a whole person. I have respect for myself. I have opinions. I've done my research. I'm ready to negotiate and I show up to interact with you. I respect you. I want you to show up as a whole person. I want you to be very honest. I want to hear what you need. I want to be able to say what I need. I want to look for the win-win. That's the opposite of the sticky floor. The sticky floor is a win-lose. Aggressiveness is a lose-win, but interdependency, healthy assertiveness, strong leadership is a win-win situation. Beautiful. Oh man, there is so much wisdom packed into this episode. Thank you, Katie. That's wonderful. Um, so much to uncover for our listeners. And I'm going to link to your site so they can make sure that they can get the books if they want, that they can sign up for some coaching or a life plan process with you, because I think there's so much value here. As we wrap up, are there any tangible takeaways that you could share with our listeners? Maybe it's one, maybe it's three, uh, that they could start to apply today as they really focus on just getting free, just uh, breaking free of any sticky floors that they might have that might be standing in their way. That's so good. So, well, one of the first things that this sounds so simple and it's kind of a common practice, but it's surprising how many of us don't do it. And that is if you could just give yourself one goal for the day. So you have a lot of tasks that you have to complete, but what's the one thing that if you got it done today, it would uh, make a lot of other things go better. So it might be that one difficult phone call. It might be that one courageous conversation. It may be that you need to transfer money somewhere just so that the bills get paid on time and you don't have late fees. But for some reason, you can't get yourself to go move the money because you don't want to. There's there's just, I mean, and I find out it's rarely like these big, like I gotta, gotta confront someone after five years of whatever and it's some horrible conversation. I'm like, it's the dumb thing. It's the transfer of money that for some reason I cannot get myself to do that. I can like, I will do the dishes. I will do a homemade dinner which I never want to do. Like I do all these other things that suddenly seem more urgent. Um, but I would just say that is part of taking leadership. That is breaking through your own sticky floor in a mini step that if you can't lead yourself well, it's really hard to lead anybody else well. And most of the time leading ourselves well is just one strategic intention each day. If you do that, everything else starts to fall into place. And over time, those add up and become exponentially beneficial to your whole life and your business. So that's the first thing. Just know what your one big thing today is and make sure it happens today. Do not put your head on the pillow, no matter how many home-baked cookies you made. Do not put your head on the pillow till it's done. <laughs> Um, I would say the second thing is to always be stretching yourself to connect with someone you don't already know. And this is a hard one. It's, it's sometimes easy for people who are real people folks or real extroverts or love to network. Um, but I find that uh, for many leaders, reaching out to those areas that aren't comfortable for them is the part that's hard. And this doesn't have to be like, let's set up a Zoom call and have 30 awkward minutes. It's like, how do I talk to the neighbor I haven't in interacted with yet? How do I say hi to a parent in car pickup line? How do I... Um, uh, talk, chat with someone in the grocery store who's uh, different than me in some way. There is something about continually expanding our experience that allows us to be connected to the human race and serve people better. When we get in our little bubble, when we get in our little tribe, when we have our little culture that we love, uh, it's very comforting and getting outside our comfort zone isn't a matter of like, we have to always be uncomfortable. I think it's a matter of expanding our brain to make sure we're living in the reality of today. Uh, so one of my favorite quotes is the mind once expanded to the dimension of new ideas, never returns to its original size. 
And so just being in the grocery store and striking up a conversation next to you with someone from a totally different socioeconomic group allows you to be a moment in their shoes and allows you to speak differently to your next group of people you speak to. It allows you to write differently that next blog. It allows you to make a more informed decision for your business. It allows you to be a better human when you understand things from a new perspective. So to me, that's a really important quality. And the higher you go in leadership, the less likely we are to do that. Oh, wow. That's interesting. And the more important it is, the higher we are in leadership, right? So it's really that dichotomy there. So just great takeaway. Talk to someone different today. Step outside of the box. That's so great. There was so much here. I'm going to share it in the show notes. Thank you, Katie, so much for being on. Just loved every minute. Thank you, Lauren, so much. I do want to say uh, that I do have a couple, I do have services, but a couple free downloads. One is the Theological Cheat Sheet. If you are someone who's navigating some faith-based baggage about your gender, that is a really great one uh, resource to go to. And if you are connecting it all with this sticky floor idea and you don't know how to speak up without overdoing it, uh, we have an assertiveness cheat sheet. Uh, which is also a really great way to sort of know how to move forward um, and know that you can confidently lead without violating some of your own values. Awesome. Thank you, Katie, so much. We'll make sure that we link to those as well so that people can get those downloads. Thanks, Lauren.